meeting of the California Board of Accountancy. My name is Nancy Corrigan, and I'm the president of the California Board of Accountancy, or CBA. Please be advised that this meeting is being conducted consistent with the provisions of Governor Gavin Newsom's Executive Order N-2920. We are also conducting this meeting under the Department of Consumer Affairs COVID-19 Prevention Plan designed to safeguard employees from COVID-19, control exposures, and reduce the spread of the virus within the workplace. One of the provisions requires wearing a mask while in the workplace with only a few exceptions. Based on this plan, the guidance regarding masks, you will note that those of us at the CBA office will be wearing a mask during our meeting, including during each presentation. Please be sure to let us know if you're having difficulty hearing us. Hopefully before too long, we can do all of this without wearing our masks. So look, we all look forward to that, I'm sure. At this time, I will turn the meeting over to Ms. Reed, Board Relations Analyst, to take roll call and establish a quorum. When Ms. Reed calls your name, please unmute your microphone and state your name so that we know you are present. Please remember to mute your microphone once you have stated your name. At the end of the call, Ms. Reed, please advise me as to whether we have a quorum. Thank you. Carrie Ann Farrell Hines. Present. Dan Jacobson. Here. Soshi Leon. Here. Luz Molina Lopez. Here. Dee Dee Owens. Present. Errol Pay. Here. Deirdre Robinson. Good morning. I'm here. Katrina Salazar. <clears throat> Good morning. Here. Michael Savoy. Present. Yen Tu. Here. And Nancy Corrigan. Nancy Corrigan. Nancy Corrigan present. Thank you. And we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Reed. For some opening remarks, I would like to thank our outstanding CBA staff and the solid team for their assistance in facilitating this virtual meeting. All of staff's effort is appreciated in helping us to be a successful board. The CBA's mission is to protect consumers by ensuring only qualified licensees practice public accountancy in accordance with established professional standards. This mission is derived from the statutory requirement that protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the California Board of Accountancy in exercising its licensing, regulatory, and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests thought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. Members of the public interested in participating in the meeting must join the WebEx meeting. Information and instructions are posted on our website. All lines are currently on mute. As I facilitate this meeting to allow the proceeding in an orderly manner, lines will remain on mute until I direct the moderator to open them for public comments. I will announce when we are accepting public comments on the various issues and the moderator will open the lines as appropriate. Five minutes will be allocated to each individual providing comments. This approach is necessary to facilitate the meeting and ensure the board has the opportunity to complete its necessary business. And I appreciate everyone's understanding of this process. At this time, I will move to agenda item one, which is public comments for items not on the March meeting agenda. The moderator will provide general instructions and then open the meeting for public comment. Moderator, please proceed. Thank you, Board President. This is the moderator. I've opened up the Q&A. Members of the public, if you would like to participate in public comment, please type, I would like to make a comment in the Q&A box by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and make sure to send it to all panelists. And just a reminder that the hand raising feature is being used for the board members and staff for discussion and members of the public can participate in the meeting via the Q&A box when requested for public comment. So I do have individual identified as Amber Setter who would like to make a comment. Amber, I'll be unmuting your microphone in just a moment.
and you have been unmuted. Wonderful. I'm hopeful you can hear me. Maybe a head nod for those. If my audio is coming through, that would be helpful. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all of you for your service. I have a secret aspiration to be sitting in your chair someday that's not so secret, but I appreciate your commitment to the profession and know my comment comes from a place of, of deep commitment to the profession. Um, my name is Amber Sutter. I, I live in San Diego. I'm an inactive CPA and um, I'm also a professional certified coach and I have a master's in leadership studies. And what I'd like to do today, just coming from my perspective and how I serve the practitioners is to draw the board's attention to something that feels like a small but significant gap in the CBA's regulations specific to continuing education. Um, I see this gap as something that's problematic for the needs of the modern day practitioner. It's incongruent with NASBA's fields of study. And ultimately, my perspective is that we're not protecting the public because we're really limiting um, an important field of study that contributes to the professional competence of the CPA. So specifically, I would like for the board to consider the amendment of the, the regulation. It's Title 16 Professional and Vocation Regulations, Article 12 Continuing Education Rules, Section 87.4. And this area excludes personal growth programs. And it says that it does this to operate under the belief, it says that personal growth programs do not contribute directly to the professional competence of the licensee. And I just, I don't believe that that's true. So let me let you in a little bit on my perspective. So in contrast, NASBA specifically names personal development as a non-technical learning activity that, that contributes to the professional competence of a CPA and fields of study that indirectly relate to the CPA's field of business. And that feels more true for me in the scope of the work that I do as a professional coach, working with thousands of coaching hours coaching CPAs. So in a piece that I authored for the Cal CPA Magazine, I suggested that the connection between mental health and performance are inextricably tied. And that for all of you to think of mental capacity like the operating system on your computer, if your mind is anxiously running several programs, there's less space available for the technical domains, for strategic thinking and problem solving. So in other words, anxiety takes up space that could be held by intellect. I believe this gap of what the CBA's rules are doing and limiting personal growth really are putting a significant limitation in a COVID world where CPAs are tasked with navigating the white water rapids of complexity and ambiguity every single day, right? Look at all these legislatives we're trying, legislative changes we're trying to navigate and alignment between Fed and state and keep clients organized. It is a lot. And as a professional certified coach, I support CPAs and their desire to become more effective as a leader. And the path we take to get there entails personal development, learning more about who a person is, what creates their anxiety, what keeps them up at night, and how to calm the psychological storms within their mind. Once a CPA has achieved mastery in this domain, they are better equipped to lead their teams and their clients through the storms of their changes. In addition to my work as a coach, I teach CPA at a national level, and it pains me to see that California CPAs cannot earn credit for my, contact, my content that is accurately categorized as personal development. Just last Friday, I led a course on mental health and performance, and I was taken aback by a final comment from an attendee. They said, you have no idea how timely this was. It saved a life. I have known the power for CPE for years, yet my knowing deepened last week. While this change would be very small, the impact could be significant. It has the potential to retain the top talent by fending off burnout. It positions the California practitioner to be of great of service to the public. And it might even save lives for those who are suffering from a second pandemic that is hitting us in the form of a mental health crisis. 
I really respect everything that you're up to and I respect and hope that you will consider this. Again, my name is Amber Sutter. I'm from San Diego, an inactive CPA by choice. Maybe now you know a little bit more why. This is the moderator. The microphone was muted. Thank you. Board President, no further requests were submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item two, report of the President uh, A, discussion regarding the California Board of Accountancy's business modernization project. And we have Mr. Sean O'Connor, Chief Project Delivery and Administrative Services Department of Consumer Affairs. Members, you have Mr. O'Connor's bio in your uh, information. I'd like to go ahead and read that for benefit of others participating. Mm -hmm. Sean O'Connor has been an employee of the Department of Consumer Affairs for over 20 years. For the last 10 years, he has assisted boards and bureaus in implementing software solutions of all levels of complexity for boards and bureaus of various sizes. Mr. O'Connor served as project director on the Bureau of Cannabis Control's licensing and enforcement system implementation, which was delivered on schedule and under budget. He is currently the project director for Business Modernization Cohort 1, which is implementing a new licensing and enforcement system for four DCA programs. This project started in January 2020 and has implemented two major software releases and enabled dozens of applications online along with multiple online consumer complaint forms. This project is currently trending to be completed on schedule and under budget. Mr. O'Connor has a bachelor's degree in English and a master's degree in public policy administration from Sacramento State University. He currently lives in Sacramento and his wife with his wife and six-year-old twins. Mr. O'Connor, we are very happy to have you. And when I read your bio and I noticed that you're very much delivering on schedule and under budget, I thought this is very important for a man who is raising twins. So welcome and we are anxious to hear from you. Well, thank you, Board President. And I can tell you that um, I frequently ap apply the project management skills in my personal life to try to keep all the plates spinning when you have uh, young twins for, for sure. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, just one moment while I coordinate something with the moderator. Moderator, do you have the slides to present or would you like me to share those? You've got them, okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you um, uh, uh, sharing my background and experience in the bio. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So the point of my presentation today is I want to provide the board with an update on much of the progress that we have made um, through the modernization planning process with the uh, Board of Accountancy staff to date um, and kind of share uh, the roadmap looking forward for you, as well as answer any of your questions about um, uh, what the progress moving forward will be as we partner with you um, on the DCA Office of Information Services side to help you improve your services through um, improvement of technology. So next slide, please, moderator. So, um, just to kind of provide a brief check-in of where we are currently, the California Board of Accountancy is actually one of about 17 programs who are currently pursuing business modernization in order to improve their services. Depending upon the requirements or processes of the program, the scope of these efforts is, um, uh, is different. Um, at a high level, really each program goes through um, a set of planning steps first. And the earliest of those planning steps, which has already been completed for the Board of Accountancy, is extensive business process mapping and uh, functional requirements gathering. Uh, that occurs in partnership with the DCA Organizational Improvement Office. Um, and then uh, once that occurs, we begin moving forward through what is called the California Department of Technology's Project Approval Life Cycle, or PAL because we are in state government and we always look for reasons to use an acronym. So uh, PAL is, uh, is a process that all medium to large projects go through with the state where it's a set of predetermined sort of checkpoints and planning, um, uh, planning characteristics that the California Dep Department of Check Technology looks at in order to assess whether it seems like a project's kind of got its house in order before we dive in and sign final contracts, before we dive in and establish a baseline for cost, a baseline for project schedule. Um, we have, at the department, um, I've participated 
in actually two large projects getting completely through the PAL process, as well as um, a variety of others who are kind of midway through the different stages. So we're bringing quite a bit of expertise in the area to help um, uh, the, uh, the board get through that. And while project planning and going through a four-stage project approval life cycle process might sound like um, not that much fun to go through or a lot of work, I can assure you that um, having gone through it a couple of times, it really does make sure that projects have checked all the boxes and done all the appropriate planning before we get started to really set them up for a success to be able to achieve those goals of coming in on schedule, on budget, um, once we get into the implementation phase. Um, so uh, at this point, um, since CBA has completed their business process mapping and functional requirements identification, uh, we're really in the stage now of what's called market research. Um, looking out there at different software and system integrators um, to see what the market for um, coming in and modernizing the IT solution, the IT system for the licensing and enforcement functionality CBA needs, what that would look like as far as um, what products are available, what they would cost, and how we want to plan out the rollout of that functionality for the California Board of Accountancy. Next slide, please, moderator. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to is, uh, emphasize as well and, um, uh, is that this is really by design with the um, Department of Business Driven Initiative. I, I mentioned on the previous slide that depending upon that we have 17 programs going through this and depending upon the requirements of that program, they're all not getting sort of the same type of software solution. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we're scaling and providing the types of solutions that make sense for your um, organization, both from a um, requirements and a regulation standpoint, as well as from a staffing standpoint and a feasibility standpoint. Um, on the IT side, we really have no interest in moving forward or pushing you in a direction that is not going to be something that, for example, the board can afford um, or the board can uh, will have issues supporting from a staffing perspective as we go into the project phase of any given project. Um, so that partnership at the business level is really important and consistent throughout the planning process. There's frequent uh, uh, dialogue that occurs between myself and my staff, as well as your leadership. Um, uh, on pretty much um, a uh, you know, couple times a month now, we are uh, having conversations about uh, moving forward uh, at least uh, on some of the deliverables we're working on. And uh, to date, uh, as I mentioned, with, with CBA already completing their business process mapping as well as their functional requirements, uh, you know, the, the commitment from the leadership and the staff level has been very exemplary. So that's very encouraging for me as your partner in moving forward to see that commitment because that is really one of the key things I think that, that helps to make these efforts a success. So let's talk about what has made um, some of the other comparable DCA efforts a success um, so far. Um, we are, uh, uh, we have currently in the process um, and we're coming up on the last half, I would say, of completing a project for uh, what's called Business Modernization Cohort 1, um, which is a, a group of boards and bureaus that includes the Board of Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists, the Bureau for Private Post-Secondary Education, the California Acupuncture Board, as well as the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Um, and we've, to date, implemented for them uh, dozens of online applications, both initial applications, renewal applications, um, back office workflows, um, and, the, and enforcement functionality for them, as well as um, uh, more kind of uh, uh, functionality that helps with the application process and offers opportunities to provide more frequent status updates to applicants or licensees on exactly where their applications are at in the process. So we've actually, for that group that I just described, got that software out there and working in production. We had our first major software release last September um, after starting the project um, in last January, which if you overlay that project period on what was going on in the world, I'm pretty proud that we were able to deliver um, uh, something in, in spite of having to transition to a completely remote uh, workforce two months into our project. Um, some of the smaller scope efforts that we've had success on to date include online renewal transactions um, where we've leveraged some in-house functionality to kind of stand up a web page to be able to um, uh, receive online renewals and allow licensees to pay for credit cards for um, a, a number of boards and bureaus. Next slide, please, uh, moderator. So moving forward in working with the Board of Accountancy, I wanted to talk through 
um, what are some of the things that um, we're going to be doing as we proceed through the project approval life cycle phases that we have left to, to complete. So um, we've already completed stage one of four. We are now working on stage two. Um, uh, and what we've, uh, worked, what we've decided after discussions with um, your leadership, um, as well as uh, reviewing with some key stakeholders in the, in the department on what steps to take forward next, as well as um, working with our partners over at the California Department of Technology, is that we want to look for an op, we, we have a unique opportunity to uh, perhaps look at a pilot type of um, effort which is a small effort where we pick maybe a, um, a one or two uh, key areas of the business process and utilize some of the software that we already have in the DCA enterprise to see if it will meet your needs. Um, we're looking to try to do that in the fall. A couple benefits to that. Number one, we can do it without, um, uh, we believe, uh, without needing to um, uh, significantly impact the board's budget. Um, and if that functionality works well, we can then look at scaling it out to other areas of the business process um, during the following fiscal year. So it's really a unique opportunity because we have newer software in our enterprise that we're utilizing for business modernization cohort one um, to go ahead and pull that over and try it at um, a relatively low um, uh, sort of a risk perspective from uh, for the Board of Accountancy. So we're looking to take advantage of that in the fall, and we're working to finalize that plan with uh, your leadership at that time and line up resources on our, on our side to, to support that. Um, and that will be folded into our planning efforts, because if that is a success, then um, uh, we will uh, know that it would make sense to make an investment in scaling that out more to the other um, uh, areas of your business and we have uh, some success and some momentum going into that um, that we can carry with us. Uh, next, oh, one, before we go to the next slide, um, moderator, I did want to mention uh, one important part. Through the project approval lifecycle process, um, and this may seem like um, uh, kind of minutia to those that don't live and breathe projects every day, but one of the key changes that occurred um, with this project approval lifecycle that CDT oversees is that we don't establish our cost baselines or project schedules until we actually have um, uh, completed all of the planning and have contracts signed. Uh, so we establish our cost baselines from that perspective. Um, that is important because it establishes a real cost baseline and project schedule and is part of the reason why so many of the projects that we've um, described uh, um, uh, in, the, in the bio or on the presentation to date have been able to come in uh, on schedule and on budget or under budget. All right, next slide, please. So I want to talk about, look a bit further even beyond planning and talk about some of the strategies that we have been using successfully once we get into the implementation phase. And many of these strategies we will be looking to utilize for the Board of Accountancy as we proceed forward um, into uh, a, a point at which we are actually deploying software um, and functionality for you. Um, we have found that the old way um, uh, of doing software rollouts was not something that worked terribly well uh, for uh, the department and, uh, and other organizations uh, within the department. Um, so an old way of doing this type of software project would be we work for three years on something, uh, we implement all of the scope all at once. So if you imagine we take your entire licensing process, your entire enforcement process, and all at once uh, we transition everything over. Well, it takes a long time to get to the point where you can make that sort of transition when you're trying to do what's called kind of a big bang approach. Um, and also that uh, leads itself to a couple of other areas of increasing complexity for your project. Number one, it really incre increases the complexity for data conversion. It also really provides a lot of staff disruption because you're, you're literally having staff go home on a Thursday, all of your staff, and come back on like a Monday and their entire world has changed and you need to make sure that you've trained up everybody for the entire change before you, um, uh, before you undergo that. So there's a lot of um, risk involved in that approach. Because of, the, of um, some changes in technology, we have newer ways um, of, of rolling out software that is less disruptive. Um, we've done this successfully on the Business Modernization Cohort 1 project, as well as the Bureau of Cannabis Control's licensing and enforcement system stand up from a couple years ago. And um, you may have heard this term before because it's out there in a lot of different contexts, but it's called an agile development for software methodology. Um, and there's a lot of different characteristics that people attribute to this, but here at DCA, 
what we really um, utilize it for is to incrementally roll out software. So I described how we would go um, about a big bang approach. As opposed to that, what we do is we target specific areas, specific areas of business function that can be carved out and um, we can focus on those areas and roll that out to production as opposed to waiting for three years and then doing everything all at once. The benefits to this is that it's less disruption over time. We can maybe look at um, certain areas of the application um, or certain areas of the board from a licensing perspective, specific applications, specific units, specific workflows, and roll those out um, in a strategic manner so that we're retraining, we're um, training staff um, in kind of a more manageable process. And the big benefit to this is that we're able to achieve and get functionality out there to production much quicker instead of having a longer development time frame that really um, uh, uh, runs the risk of regulations and statutes changing while we're midstream and we have to start redoing things already before we've even launched anything out into production. Um, I mentioned before that this has worked successfully for us on a couple of other projects. Um, and we're looking to continue to try and utilize this uh, process moving forward uh, for, the, uh, for the Board of Accountancy. Next slide, please. Um, another key area that we will be bringing to um, uh, managing your project is uh, vendor and contract management. So um, we have found what we believe to be a very effective way to control for vendor quality as well as vendor cost. Um, and the way we do that is through um, contracts that focus in on a work order authorization process. So what is that? Um, at the point at which we're doing a large scale sort of software implementation, we inevitably have to bring on a system integrator of some, of some sort, uh, an individual or a group of individuals who are familiar with implementing the software that we have um, selected to, to work for you. Um, what we do is we identify a scope of work, a set of tasks and deliverables, um, a large scope of work that will have a not to exceed overall amount. Um, and we break that down into chunks. So we essentially create mini contracts or what are called work order authorizations within that larger contract. So we have a contract that identifies, for example, um, uh, maybe 50 tasks um, and 10 deliverables. Actual contracts are much, much larger than that, but conceptually let's consider that. Um, we take that uh, group of 50 tasks and 10 deliverables and we break that down through our work order authorization process to maybe monthly or six week chunks of work. So we identify what we're gonna achieve over that period. Um, we have set up a work order authorization which includes in it the requirements that need to be met for the vendor to be paid for that work, um, including the acceptance of deliverables, what staff are gonna be working on the work, um, and, uh, and what uh, are the acceptance criteria that is needed in order to pay for that work. So um, that allows us to control for over time uh, how the project is going. And also, if for some reason something is not working, then we can have a, we have the ability to kind of pause with the vendor and say, look, these staff members aren't um, really working out. We don't want to see them on next month's work order authorization. We see an issue with um, the delivery time frame for these types of deliverables. We need to work out a way to put a hook into um, the payment provision so that we can ensure that you're delivering these deliverables on time moving forward. So. It's worked on several projects and it's a great way to control costs and doesn't put us in a position to where we're cutting, you know, a, a large check um, uh, at the end of a project or at the beginning of a project when significant work or progress hasn't been shown yet. Let's go ahead and move on to, I think, one of my last slides before I open it up for any questions. Yes, it is my last slide. So. Um, Happy to open it up for questions from the members of the board or any uh, CBA staff regarding anything I've presented here, or if there's any topics related to um, IT project modernization that you wanna cover that I haven't mentioned so far, um, I would be happy to discuss that as well. So thank you for the time and I'll pause now for questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, members, are there any questions regarding this valuable and important presentation? Ms. Owens. Yes, thank you for the detailed presentation. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of what you've provided to us. Can you reiterate for me the timeline again? I may have missed that in the, in the beginning of uh, the timeline of the project. Sure, so um, we're currently um, looking at uh, implementing uh, that pilot that I had mentioned in the fall of this year. So um, the, uh, the timeline, the exact timeline for that is not 100% set yet. 
But the idea would be that we would be able to implement that um, pilot uh, in the fall so that we could put ourselves in a position to evaluate it and then determine if we wanted to move forward um, uh, after that with um, uh, the software vendor for a larger scope or scaled out project. And that would put us at, um, uh, based on some discussions that we've had with your leadership, likely beginning the project, uh, larger scope project phase of that um, in the following fiscal year. So that, um, and part of that could be because we will need to um, uh, uh, identify and request um, uh, additional expenditure authority. So that was only afforded to you at certain times of the year. So that would be um, rolling out a pilot in the fall of this year and then provided that is successful, we close out our planning phase and then start in on the project phase in the subsequent July. So that would be July of uh, 2022. Thank you. Um, anything further from members? I have a few staff present here, but I think um, questions are answered at this point and looking so forward to working with you and accomplishing this project. And uh, thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Members, I'm going to be moving on to agenda item 2B, report on the Department of Consumer Affairs President's training. Uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, or DCA, provided leadership training that I attended along with our Vice President, uh, Mr. Savoy, on February 2nd. Leaders of various DCA boards gathered to share information, including testimonials from two executive officers, one of which was our own, uh, Ms. Bowers. DCA discussed the skills that are necessary for the effectiveness of any board president or board leader to include understanding of the board, its mission and functions, command of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, knowledge of enforcement codes and processes, writing and editing skills, communication and active listening, impartiality and respect, leadership and collaboration, organization and humility. All of this with the ultimate goal of meeting our consumer protection mission. The board member management portion of the president's role ensures that board members are in compliance with their training and performing their duties as a member of the board. Some of the key board member duties include timely voting on discipline matter, disciplinary matters, completing required training, attending scheduled board meetings, being prepared for meetings by reading all materials uh, well in advance, managing the relationship with the executive officers to ensure she is effective in her oversight of daily operations. These daily operations are what effectuate the decisions made by the CBA and implementing our vision. Um, I was honored to have been included in the interview process in December where DCA was gathering information and preparing and planning for their training session. So I was um, very happy about that. And uh, I would encourage that uh, CBA members serving as president, vice president in the future participate in that training. It's very beneficial. Thank you and members. Uh, are there any questions regarding that presentation? Seeing that there are none, I am going to move on to agenda item 2C, resolution for retired California Board of Accountancy member Corolla Anna Nicholson. This is legal, please. If we could ask for public comment on the, uh, the previous items. Um, I don't think we took a motion. Are we required to have public comment? Uh, the policy moving forward is especially due to um, the limitations of uh, the public being able to raise their hands is to ask for public comment on all topics of discussion. Okay, so all agenda items. Um, thank you. I will be sure to do that going forward then. Um, and at this point, we should stop and ask. So that would be for agenda item 2A and B. Is that correct, Ms. Joffrey? Correct. Moderator, would you please ask for public comments? Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists.
No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Members, I'm moving on to agenda item 2C. Again, resolution for retired California Board of Accountancy member Corolla Ann Nicholson, CPA. And you will see that resolution in your materials. Whereas Corolla Anna Nicholson, CPA, was appointed to, by Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr., and she has faithfully served as a member of the California Board of Accountancy from July 24, 2017 through December 31, 2020, and whereas she served as chair and a member of the Legislative Committee, member of the Committee on Professional Conduct, and member of the Enforcement Program Oversight Committee, and California Board of Accountancy member liaison to the Peer Review Oversight Committee and Qualifications Committee, and whereas throughout her term of service at all times, Corolla Anna Nicholson CPA gave fully of herself and her ideas and acted forthrightly and conscientiously, always with the public interest and welfare in mind, and whereas she is a member of the California Society of Certified Public Accountants, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the Santa Barbara Bull Foundation Board of Directors, and a member of the Santa Barbara City College Foundation Audit Committee, and whereas Corolla Anna Nicholson CPA has been a founding partner at Nicholson and Schwartz since 2000. Prior to being a founding partner, she was a tax manager at Ernst & Young LLP. And whereas her colleagues wish to express to her their high esteem and regard, now therefore be it resolved that the members of the California Board of Accountants express heartfelt appreciation for Corolla Anna Nicholson CPA for the outstanding contribution she made during her term of service on the California Board of Accountancy and to the Consumers of California. Members, do I have a motion in, in, uh, to adopt this resolution? Ms. Salazar? I'd like to make a motion to adopt this resolution. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farrell Hines? I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any um, discussion from the members? Seeing that there is none, are there any comments from the public? This is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. Board President, no requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Thank you. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and then provide the results? Thank you. Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. D.D. Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, continuing on with agenda item 2D through I involving retired or retiring advisory committee members. And the qualifications committee, I have Christian George, CPA, Charles W. Hester, Senior CPA, and Cliff J. Liker, Junior CPA. Under the Enforcement Advisory Committee, I have Thomas Gilbert, CPA. And under the Peer Review Oversight Committee, I have Jeffrey DeLizer, CPA, and Arena Orespova, CPA. These members are appreciated for their service to the CBA and these three invaluable committees. Members, unless a member would like to take each resolution individually, um, I will accept a motion to accept these various uh, resolutions for the advisory committees. Ms. Robinson? Ms. Robinson, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, we're so moved on the uh, motion to accept the group. 
Thank you. Ms. Tu? I would like to second that motion. Thank you. Members, is there any further discussion regarding these resolutions? Seeing that there are none, moderator, would you please open it for uh, public comment? Members of the public, if you would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. Board President, no requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. And Ms. Reed, would you now call for the vote and then provide the results? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Sochi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Georgia Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Yen Tu? Sorry. Sorry. Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Members, I'm moving on to agenda item 2J. Discussion regarding the proposed California Board of Accountants and Committee meeting format and announcement of the new committee and liaison assignments. Uh, as you know, the Executive Order N2920 in response to COVID-19 pandemic created travel restrictions and social distancing requiring that we conduct our board meetings uh, via video conference. And as such, we uh, disbanded our standing committee meetings and had all business conducted under the president's report as a part of the CBA meeting agenda. Now that we have CBA members, stakeholders, and members of the public um, acclimated to this digital, visual virtual meeting format, it's important that we resume standing committee uh, meetings. Um, this, was divided, this was decided by CBA leadership as a very important function in deliberating matters prior to presentation to the full board as well as several other benefits that we identified. So beginning in May, the standing committees will resume meeting in conjunction with the CBA meeting and uh, the committee appointments you will find on attachment two that were previously provided to you. The committee and CBA meeting will be conducted over a two-day format with the committee meetings being held on Thursdays, followed by any scheduled petition hearings at 1.30 p.m. and closed sessions being conducted just after those hearings. At the president's discretion, any other agenda items that can be handled that do not interfere with transparency or timing of presenters, that sort of thing, will be handled uh, on that first day. <clears throat> the CBA public meeting portion will be conducted on Friday starting in the morning. This will allow sufficient time for consumers, members, and staff to transition between committee meetings in the video conference format that we're now getting used to. It also gives sufficient time for staff to prepare talking points for the committee chairperson to report to the full board at the Friday meeting. Regarding the Mobility Stakeholders uh, Group, or MSG, no appointments were made to that committee, as you noted on the agenda item. The MSG's purpose uh, of implementing the mobility program has been concluded and any further work should come forward would be handled with one of the standing committees or the CBA meeting itself. Staff will be providing, um, presenting a proposed statutory change to disband, disband the MSG at a future meeting. So members, I welcome any feedback regarding the process that we will be starting in May, if you have any. Ms. Melina Lopez. Yes, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. President. Um, in the event that we don't have a two-day meeting, um, when would we present the public report on the um, on the committee? Sorry, I missed part of that. In the event that we do not have a two-day meeting, what was the mm -hmm. rest of that? When would we present the as a when the the committee chair when would the the report and the talking points when would that be presented 
because if it's a one day meeting, it would have to be that same day on Thursday. I'm just curious uh, would it at the end of the agenda list, for example. In May, they will be two day meetings in order to facilitate the process, the process that I just kind of went through with you. So they will be two day meetings starting in May. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Uh, uh, I know that this is, uh, I wanted to ask of staff if they have heard any word, I know this is pretty early, but any word about the potential for a return to uh, offices, uh, you know, later in the year, just out of curiosity, since we're talking about scheduling. Bowers. Hi, good morning. This is Patty Bowers. Um, no, there's been discussions regarding uh, the virtual meeting versus in person, but there's been no indication as to when that might occur. Anything further from board members on this topic? Moderator, would you open it to the public for any comments? Thank you. This is the moderator. Members of the public who would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. Board President, no requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please, thank you. I am moving on to agenda item 2K, National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Committee Interest Form. Uh, members, you received this information in uh, with your uh, materials for the meeting, and these are opportunities to participate on committees with the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, or NASBA. And if you are interested in serving on one of those, you must complete an online application and submit it no later than May 7th. For any of us already serving on committees and wanting to be reappointed, we must also go through that process or NASBA will assume that we no longer want to be active. And the attachment in your materials shows the time commitment and the various committees available. Now, I have an important note to share with you that in February, the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services, or OPES, issued a new department policy that board members and instructors should not serve as expert consultants for nor participate in any aspect of licensure, examination, development, or administration. OPS, OPES did review NASBA's committee charges and time requirements. It does not believe that there are any such uh, conflicts or possibility for conflicts of interest for members. So for the time being, and given our restrictions in California, these meetings will be conducted through conference call or conference video to assist with those of you who are uh, interested in applying. It does give us uh, important national representation and that sort of thing, so the committees are very important. If you are interested in thinking of applying and do apply, please let uh, Rebecca Reed, our CBA Board Relations Analyst, know as she must uh, track uh, what we're doing and what we're uh, applying for. And if you have any questions regarding the process, you may also ask Ms. Reed. Members, do you have any questions regarding this agenda item or any comments? If there are none, moderator, would you please open it uh, to the public for any comments? This is the moderator. I've opened up the Q&A. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. <clears throat> Board President, no requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Please, thank you. I'm moving on to agenda item 2L, discussion and possible action on the acceptance of scores from the pilot administration of the Uniform Certified Public Accountant Examination by Remote Proctor. We have Ms. Michelle Center, Chief Licensing Division. 
Thank you, President Corrigan. For this item, the CBA is being asked uh, is being provided with information regarding staff's consultation with legal counsel regarding the CBA's authority to not accept valid scores from candidates of other jurisdictions that participate in the pilot administration of the CPA exam by remote proctor. It's a mouthful, so I will refer to that as the RT pilot. Please note this item also included supplemental information consisting of an article by Pro Forum, as well as a CBA cover memo to that article. From March 18th through April 30th, 2020, Prometric Testing Center shut down and reopened in May of 2020 with additional safety measures and limited capacity at that time. The COVID-19 pandemic experience has identified the need for an alternative approach to ensure testing continues in times of emergency. NASDA and AICPA agree that it is prudent to perform a small-scale pilot live test of CPA exam remote proctoring before it may be needed for true emergency use. At the January 2021 CBA meeting, NASDA presented on ProMetrics Pro Proctor product and the phased pilot approach it is undertaking. Attachment one, the proposed pilot of remote proctoring of the CPA examination, update and FAQs for boards of accountancy, another long one that I will refer to as the white paper, outlines additional details regarding the proposed RT pilot. As discussed in the white paper, the RT pilot is being structured to test a true remote proctored production environment that will test software, systems, interfaces, and processes while also reducing risk by restricting the exam content, candidates, as well as the testing window. The piloting with actual CPA candidates is anticipated to begin in the second quarter of 2021 and is a vital aspect of the approach to test and analyze the feasibility of the implementation of Pro Proctor in support of remote proctoring. The RT pilot will include a small number of volunteer candidates from selected boards of accountancy. Candidates will not be required to participate in the RT pilot. While the RT pilot will not include California candidates, it is possible that candidates from other states participating in the RT pilot may, may seek licensure in California. These candidates would be required to transfer their CPA exam scores to California as a requirement of the CPA licensure application process. The letter from NASBA in attachment two requests all boards determine if they have authority to not accept scores from the RT pilot. After review of California statutes, legal counsel did not find any statute that would provide the board authority to not accept valid scores from the RT pilot, the validity determined by AICPA. Therefore, staff recommend the CBA submit the letter in attachment three to NASBA. I would like to turn it back over to President Corrigan and will do my best to answer questions. Members, do you have any questions for Ms. Center? And seeing that there are none, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation? Ms. Robinson? The motion is uh, moved, please, to adopt. Thank you. Mr. Pay? Second. Thank you. Members, is there any further discussion at this point? Seeing no hands raised. Moderator, would you also ask for public comment? Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and then advise us on the outcome? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. Sir Leon? Yes. 
Luis Molina Lopez? Yes. D.D. Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 2M, review and consideration of possible positions on legislation. I have Ms. Deanne Pierce, Assistant Executive Officer, and Mr. Patrick Ibarra, Information and Planning Officer. Agenda item M1 is Assembly Bill 29, State Bodies. Thank you. Good morning. President Corrigan, members of the board, I am Patrick Ibarra, Information and Planning Officer with the CVA. Along with Assistant Executive Officer Deanne Pierce, I will be presenting on item 2M, the review and consideration of possible positions on legislation. Before we get started though, I'd like to acknowledge CVA staff recently received guidance from the Department of Consumer Affairs or DCA as it relates to the fiscal impact of the legislation. During a leadership meeting on Tuesday, DCA directed boards to include specific projections regarding the fiscal impact. This will replace current terminology such as minor and absorbable. This approach will be included in written analyses for the May CBA meeting. But for today, we will provide a verbal update on the fiscal impact if it is available. Any bill that we don't have a fiscal impact update on will be provided as soon as it is available. In regards to Assembly Bill 1 or 29 by Assemblymember Cooper, this bill will require that any public meeting notice as issued pursuant to the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act must also include all writings or materials in connection with a matter subject to discussion or consideration at that meeting. These writings or materials are to be made available on the state's, state body's internet website and to any person who requests the writings or materials in writing on the same day they are distributed to members of the state body or at least 72 hours in advance of the meeting whichever is earlier. The bill prohibits the state body from distributing or discussing materials that do not comply with this requirement. Although it's possible the provisions could impact CVA discussions, the ultimate goal is transparency, which is the focus of the Open Meeting Act. AB 29 will not have a fiscal impact on the CVA. Staff recommends the CVA make a motion to adopt a watch position on AB 29. I will turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Members, are there any questions regarding Assembly Bill 29? Ms. Hines? Uh, thank you for the presentation on this bill. Uh, are they accepting comments about these or have you all uh, considered subject, submitting any kind of comments on these? Because it seems like there should be some kind of uh, exception, but also a way to um, like either to make the materials um, to allow the materials to be distributed and discussed, but not acted upon or because it seems like particularly while we are operating in this, you know, um, continuing to operate in the pandemic under emergency circumstances. There should be a way for bodies to uh, have last minute items up for discussion, even if we're not able to immediately take action or to approve action via, you know, electronically uh, and have, you know, a public disclosure requirement rather than having an absolute prohibition on, on items that do not make it underneath that, make it in within that limited time frame. You know, have you all had any discussions? Has staff had any discussions about that? We just get so many materials. We got a mail out, you know, but yesterday for this meeting, and that would mean that anything we got yesterday would we couldn't act upon it today. Ms. Pierce, could you address uh, Ms. Hines' question? Sure. Um, 
I think some of the materials that were recently sent out were closed session, which wouldn't uh, necessarily um, apply in this particular situation. Um, I think the reason we were, you know, focusing on a watch position, um, you know, and of course the board can, you know, take whatever position it wants is that the board isn't being precluded from uh, taking action on anything. What it's being precluded is from providing any more written materials past that 72 hour time frame. So we can provide information to the board. It would just need to be more in a verbal update. One of the things that comes to mind is the legislation. So um, as we are, um, you know, getting recent or frequent updates with regards to legislation, um, oftentimes, you know, it's kind of easy to maybe send out a, an updated bill a day or two before the meeting. That wouldn't be able to happen, but we could still provide a verbal update regarding the information. So the board is still able to act. It has more to do with the um, additional written materials that are being provided to the members and posted on the website. So where I'm happy, you know, uh, staff is happy to, you know, go back and, and communicate with the author's office um, with any further direction that the board may have. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Molina. Sorry, I'm sorry, if I could just follow up on that item. I, I would like to ask that there be some, some further discussion uh, because I could see, particularly as we get into the, um, those you know, final days of negotiation of bills and budgets and things like that, where things are moving pretty quickly. Uh, we It does put us at a bit of a disadvantage to say that if we get information about a bill, say, you know, the day or two before the meeting, we would not be able to um, express an opinion as the board because that additional material and information is coming within that period of time. So I do think that for boards and commissions, particularly where, you know, you have basically volunteers who are filling in their time, you know, as, you know, as, as they can, making time to serve and then trying to make sure that they're able to, you know, to act appropriately. I think it would be helpful to keep that kind of information in mind. And, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, be of support on this because I can just I serve in other on other public boards and commissions and I can see how there would be some burden on us as members with that kind of a strict requirement. Here. Uh, just to clarify, I just want to make sure that it's if I hear what you're saying is you want to maybe have um, some kind of uh, exemption for legislative type items that those particular materials can come and not have to meet the 72 hours in advance. I just want to make sure that I'm clear, you know, as we, you know, start, uh, if we're going to be having discussions with the author's office. That is one exception that I can think of that is notable. I, there may be others that other, you know, folks consider, but that's one, one exception that I think is particularly notable. Items that, that, you know, are subject to, you know, fast moving action that may, you know, fall, run afoul of the 72 hour uh, limitation. And I just one more clarification um, on my end is as long as it's noticed on the agenda, the board can take action and discuss it. It's more just the physical receipt of any hard copy materials by the board members sending those out within that 72 hours. So I just want to clarify that as long as it's on the agenda, the board can discuss and take action on it. Um, and we can provide verbal updates regarding any additional information um, in that, you know, narrow window right before the meeting. So I just wanted to add that clarification. Okay. I would I would consult with council about what it means to provide addition to provide notice on the agenda and what kinds of additional information is allowed to be provided that could influence uh, board members in voting on on items. I'm not I, I would just confirm and clarify that because I know that there are rules and uh, rules and requirements regarding the description of items to be acted upon in the agenda 
And if there are, you know, substantive changes, does that impact or affect the disclosure, meeting the disclosure requirements? I don't know if it does, but I'm saying, suggesting just confirm with council that, you know, if those kinds of changes were to be made, would that run afoul of the disclosure requirements? Thank you, Ms. Hines, and certainly uh, staff can do that. Ms. Melina Lopez? Yes, thank you, President Corrigan. I have concerns about this only because I feel it would slow down business. Uh, we meet six times a year, and um, as it is, sometimes it feels like, you know, government issues are always slow, and decision making is uh, held up sometimes. And so I would hate for this. Uh, we would need we would be um, we wouldn't be able to do business as efficiently as we can. Um, one other question is how would this affect the receipt of materials for closed session? Uh, oftentimes we do receive them past the 72 hour mark. Um, would that still be able to happen? Ms. Pierce? Yes, that would still be able to happen. That wouldn't it wouldn't uh, uh, impact any of the closed session information or discussions that sent out. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you. I think that transparency is very important. However, this seems to require. Sometimes you can, you can. It seems to require staff to be so involved with transparency that staff may be able to just be doing transparency, not just, but that's speaking hyperbolically, but not to be able to get its work done. I think that it's just too much stuff. Um, I may be able to uh, support the bill if uh, the materials were simply required for the internet, but that it's re that all this stuff is is uh, required to be posted wherever the posting is required is required seems to be overkill and counterproductive. Thank you, Ms. Salazar. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I, I heard an initial request to reach out to the author's office, and so I wanted to uh, make, make a comment, because what I was hearing is, or a suggestion for me personally, um, I was hearing that we are allowed to introduce materials such as legislative changes where bill amendments have happened within 72 hours, provided they are read verbally. I understand that would impact the brevity of the meeting, um, but as a visual learner, if we are able to read it to be compliant, uh, my ask as a board member is that in conjunction with the required reading, which meets the goal of transparency uh, that written materials also be provided because some people are visual some people actually need to take time with translations and i believe that presenting information with full transparency might be a way to compromise by allowing multiple modes um, so that would be a suggestion i respectfully appreciate the consideration if there are uh, internal discussions within our board or with the author. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion members? Do I have a motion in connection with staff's recommendation? Ms. Hines? I move to adopt the staff's recommendation for a watch position with the uh, request that there be report back after discussions with the author's office. Second, Ms. Salazar. I would like to second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion from the members? Any further discussion from the members? Seeing that there is none, moderator, would you please open it up for public comment? 
is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. And Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and please provide us with the results? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. Dan Jacobson? No. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 2M2, Assembly Bill 107, Licensure Veterans and Military Spouses, Mr. Ibarra. Thank you again. Assembly Bill 107 by Assembly Member Salas would expand the existing provisions for the granting of temporary licenses to include the California Board of Accountancy, as well as seven other Department of Consumer Affairs boards, which are listed in the analysis and requires the issuance of that license within 30 days. For boards which currently do not offer temporary licensure, this bill would require them to issue a regular license after appropriate investigation if the applicant meets, the, meets specific requirements. The provisions requiring the issuance of a temporary license would not apply to a board that has a process in place by which an out-of-state licensed applicant in good standing who meets the veteran or military spouse criteria identified in the bill and is able to receive expedited tempor temporary authorization to practice while meeting state-specific requirements for a period of at least one year. The bill makes other provisions for the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Department of Veterans Affairs that does not directly impact the CBA. The CBA would be excluded from the provisions of the bill as there is a process in place by which an individual who meets the specified qualifications can receive expedited licensure or qualified to practice under the current mobility provisions. This bill has moved forward since the analysis was prepared as it passed the Assembly Business and Professions Committee and is now scheduled for a hearing in the Assembly, Military, and Veterans Affairs Committee. Because the CBA would be excluded from the provisions of the bill, there is no fiscal impact to the board. Staff recommend the CBA make a motion to adopt the support position on AB 107. I will turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion, and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Members, are there any questions for Mr. Ibarra on this item? Uh, Mr. Jacobson. How does that relate to uh, agenda item M3, AB 225? Ms. Pierce, would you respond, please? Uh, yes, they are, they are very similar. This one would include us into, um, this one would, is adding boards for the requirement to issue a temporary license. And the AB 2225 uh, is um, putting us in a different part of, the, of a similar um, code section to issue a permanent license that can be uh, revoked at a later, uh, can be withdrawn at a later time. But this particular bill requires us to issue a temporary license. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tu? Thank you, President Kerrigan. Um, I have a question regarding the temporary. Uh, how long is that? Is that is there a sunset to this? Because a lot of time military assignment lasts a year, two years, whatever the case may be. Where does that fall? I mean, 
do they do they um, contact you in the department to let you know that they're no longer in California? Here. This um, bill, the way it's framed right now, uh, the board would be excluded from having to issue a temporary license because we have a provision in place that allows for expedited licensure or for an individual to practice under our mobility provisions. So um, although we are being included in the group um, that kind of starts out, you know, to issue a temporary license, the, the provision excludes us because we have, um, we have a, a pro process in place to offer immediate practice rights. So we wouldn't be required to issue that temporary license. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Melina Lopez? Yes, thank you. Uh, the language in the bill identifies a 30-day period for the issuance of these temp licenses. And I'm curious whether our process at the CBA uh, fits within that timeline. If, if I could just clarify, if you can clarify the question, we would be excluded from this because we have a provision in place that allows for immediate practice rights. So right. under our, I apologize, go right ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just meant, yes, I do understand that. I wonder um, how, what is the timeline for our process? What we currently oh. have in place? Are we oh. able to allow licensees to practice within those 30 days? Okay. Um, it, if we were subject to the provisions of the bill, um, we are expedited process right now for um, military individuals is I think I, I could defer to Ms. Center, but I think our most recent processing time frame was two to three days for expedited licensure. And under our mobility provisions, there is no notice or fee, so those practice rights are immediate. Thank you. Mr. Jacobson, was there something further? Okay, I see your, your hand. Mr. Jacobson? Well, thank you very much. It seems like because of the similarity between this bill and AB, 225, it's confusing. Um, it's confusing to people who are doing research on, would be confusing if they were both passed. I think it's easier uh, for uh, consumers to just, for, for just one of the two to, to pass, and I have a preference for 225. Uh, for, for the reasons that have been uh, stated earlier about the differences. Thank you. Um, members, do I have a motion? Oh. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, members, do I have a motion in connection with Assembly Bill 107, please? Ms. Lopez? Thank you. I make a motion to follow staff's recommendation to support AB 107. Thank you. And do I have a second? Ms. Owens? Yes, I second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from members? Seeing that there is none, moderator, would you please open it to the public for any comments? Yeah, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type up. I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And Ms. Reed, would you please call for the vote and provide the result? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. Dan Jacobson? No. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Yes. Dee Dee Owen? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Mr. Pay? Yes. yes. Thank you. Deirdre Robinson? 
Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? Yen Tu? And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item two and agenda item item two and three, Assembly Bill two twenty-five, Department of Consumer Affairs, Boards, Veterans, Military Spouses, Licenses. Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Our next bill is Assembly Bill two twenty-five. Assistant Executive Officer Deanne Pierce is going to present this bill for us. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Jacobson uh, mentioned, the former bill and this bill um, are, are similar. And um, I know sometimes it, it makes it uh, confusing, but we need to look at each bill um, individually. And so as I cover um, different parts of, of AB 225, um, we have to look at the changes that are proposed to the code sections and try not to incorporate the changes from the prior bill, so to try to keep them um, distinct. Under AB 107, um, it was adding us and additional boards into a provision to um, offer a, a temporary license. And so that was the proposal under that particular piece of legislation. Under AB 225, what it's saying is that if we're not included um, as a board to offer a temporary license, then we are to issue a license to an applicant who meets the criteria in the analysis um, items one through five. So um, there is a little bit of a difference here. This would be a permanent license. It would not be a temporary license. Um, one of the things I want to note here is um, we have been working uh, with the author's office to get a similar exclusion um, that I just mentioned under AB 107. So uh, in working with the author's office, because we have a process in place, a couple processes actually, one that would allow, um, that requires us to do expedited licensure, um, and then the other one that allows for immediate practice rights under our mobility provisions. And so um, we've just actually over the last couple of days and even this morning, uh, the author is very uh, supportive of including that um, exemption in the bill. So uh, we are recommending a support if amended position. And that's really um, based on, you know, trying to get that amendment in there to exclude us from these provisions. Um, because of the immediate practice rights and expedited licensure. And if we are amended, um, uh, if there is an exclusion provided in the bill, there would be no fiscal impact to the board. So I just want to update on that. But staff recommends the CDA adopt a support if amended position on AB 107, and I will turn it back over to President Corrigan uh, for discussion, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, I was on my last bill. Uh, yes, AB 225, a supportive amended position and I'll turn it back over to President Corrigan. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Um, questions from the members, Ms. Melina Lopez. Well, I was, I was gonna make the motion, I don't have a question. Seeing that- I make I a motion to approve. Thank you, seeing that I, I'm I have- I'm sorry, President. <laughs> We're a little bit out of order. So I was asking for questions and comments. I'm assuming there are none, though I see another hand. May I have a motion, Ms. Melina Lopez? Yes, thank you. I make a motion to follow staff's recommendation to support, if amend, AB 225. Thank you. And do I have a second, Mr. Jacobson? I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? from the members, seeing that there is none. Moderator, would you please open it up to the public for discussion? Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx stream and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists.
Board President, no requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. And Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and please provide the results? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines? Yes. yes. Dan Jacobson? Yes. yes. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Georgia Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 2M4, Assembly Bill 298, Accountancy, California Board of Accountancy. Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Our next bill is Assembly Bill 298. Assistant Executive Officer Deanne Pierce is going to present this bill for us as well. Thank you. AB 298, authored by Assembly Member Irwin and sponsored by the California Board of Accountancy, contains the following provisions. It authorizes an applicant to take the uniform CPA exam um, prior to completing the necessary educational requirements. It provides specific authority for the secretary treasurer to preside at meetings of the CBA and authorizes the CBA president to designate a non-officer board member to preside if all officers of the board are absent or unable to act at that meeting. And further, it clarifies that email addresses provided by applicants and licensees are not to be considered a public record and not disclosable under the Public Records Act. Working with stakeholders, staff have identified uh, possible amendments to AB 298 for CBA consideration. The first amendments, which are identified on attachment three, relate to the CPA exam before education completion proposal. The proposed amendments provide more detail, including the time frame for submission of an application for the CPA exam and the time frame for the submission of transcripts documenting completion of the educational requirements. The second proposed amendment, which is identified on attachment four, relates to the ethics education requirement for CPA licensure, specifically the provision that requires a minimum of three semester units or four quarter units in courses devoted to accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities. Based on feedback from stakeholders, this requirement may be creating a barrier for out-of-state applicants to complete their education. Working with stakeholders, staff is proposing to include two additional course options that would meet the specific requirement. The courses include auditing and fraud. These additional courses still maintain a strong foundation in ethics education that applicants must meet before CPA licensure. Last, you will notice that staff are proposing to make some non-substantive edits to provisions that are outdated, and these are also identified on attachment four. There is no fiscal impact to the CBA. Staff recommend the CBA make a motion to maintain its sponsor position on AB 298, approve the proposed new language for Business and Professions Code Section 5093.5 regarding the CPA exam prior to completion of the education requirements, Approve the proposed language in Business and Professions Code Section 5094.3 regarding the ethics education requirement and direct staff to work with the author's office to have both proposals amended into AB 298. And I will turn it back over to President Corrigan for discussion and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Members, do we have any questions or comments in connection with Ms. Pierce's presentation? Seeing that there are none members, do I have a motion? Ms. Robinson? Yes, I make a motion to um, accept the staff recommendation as outlined um, through steps one through four. Thank you. And do I have a second? Mr. Jacobson? I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from board members? Seeing that there is none, moderator, would you please open it for public comment? 
Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. I do have an individual identified as Jason Fox who would like to make a comment. Jason, I will unmute your microphone in just a moment. You have been unmuted. Uh, Jason Fox with the California Society of CPAs. In the interest of time, I'll be brief, but uh, we support both of these changes, and I think these are going to be very helpful um, to a lot of candidates uh, coming through this, the pipeline. Uh, so we appreciate the board's work and the board's uh, staff's attention to both of these uh, pieces. So thank you. Another individual identified as Pat Joyce would like to make a comment. Pat, I will unmute your microphone now. I appreciate that, everyone. Pat Joyce on behalf of the national accounting firms, uh, PwC, Deloitte, EY, KPMG, and Grant Thornton. I uh, just want to echo Jason's comments and <clears throat> ask for the board support for these two changes. Uh, they're certainly important to our firms in terms of removing uh, potential barriers for some of the talent we're trying to hire. Um, so appreciate the staff's work and uh, encourage your support. Thank you. Board President, no further requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. And Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and please provide the result? Carrie Ann Farrell Hines. Dan Jacobson. Yes. Soshi Leon. Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item two, item M two M five, Assembly Bill six forty six, Department of Consumer Affairs Board to expunge convictions. Uh, Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Assembly Bill six forty six by Assemblymember Lowe would require a licensing board under the Department of Consumer Affairs, including the California Board of Accountancy, to update information on its website regarding licensees who have had their licenses revoked due to criminal convictions that are subsequently expunged pursuant to Penal Code Section 1203.4. AB 646 raises various implementation concerns that need to be addressed with the author's office. Potential amendments the CBA may seek to pursue include, consider requesting the author amend the bill to clarify that the terms reapplies and relicensed have the same meaning as petition and reinstated. Clarify that the actions required of a DCA board or bureau only apply in situations where all criminal convictions associated with the revocation are expunged pursuant to PC section 1203.4. Clarify that a revocation that includes both criminal and non-criminal violations of the law is excluded from the requirements of AB 646. Clarify how a board or bureau should reference the status of a license displayed through the online license lookup search tool under these circumstances. This bill has moved forward since the analysis was prepared as it passed the Assembly Business and Professions Committee and is now scheduled for a hearing in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. As the bill presently exists, there could be a fiscal impact and staff are continuing to work on that analysis. There is, however, a fee for an individual to pursue this option, which may offset some costs. At this time, Staff recommend that the CBA do not take a position until additional information is received. It is anticipated that the presentation for the May meeting will provide any additional amendments that may have occurred and a possible recommendation on a position at that time. I will turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion and I, and also Mr. Franzella, our enforcement chief, are available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, uh, members. Questions regarding this presentation, Mr. Jacobson? I'm sorry, I did not un understand the the, uh, uh, dis the potential discussion regarding uh, criminal and non-criminal issues. Did, did I hear that right? Uh, 
Ms. Pierce? Yes, it would include, I, are you referring to the um, potential amendments? Correct. Thank you. And, and um, I, I don't I, understand how, how, how would an, a non-criminal issue would be involved if it, it involves expungement of, of criminal issues. I'm going, with President Corrigan's permission, I'm going to have um, Mr. Franzella assist. Yes, please, Mr. Franzella. Thank you. So I, in relation to this uh, request, there are certain uh, board accusations and final decisions that resulted in disposition that charged not only criminal actions, but also charged other violations that would be non-criminal in nature. So you could have a final disposition that has both of those elements in there. And this particular bill does not provide much clarity when a situation like that exists. Thank you. I, 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 I would like to add that uh, my recollection is that it, it, this was a two year bill and we had a watch position on it at the, uh, from last year. I, um, I believe last year uh, when we presented or were planning to present the bill was at the March meeting, which was subsequently canceled. And that was the end of the two year session, if I recall right. So the bill has been reintroduced as part of the new two year bill cycle. Um, and so the board never took a position last time. I do believe the board staff back in March of last year was presenting uh, potentially a watch position. Um, and so this time we're, we're recommending that we, the board not take action at this time so we can work with the author's office and see if there's any other adjustments that can be made. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this topic, members? Seeing that there are none, moderator, would you open it to the public from any, any comments they may have? Thank you. This is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. And uh, Ms. Robinson, your hand is raised. I might have missed it. Did you have something further on this item? No, other than to make a motion, please. Thank you. Well, actually, at this point, we're, staff is not recommending anything, um, support, oppose, or watch, because they will be gathering more information. So that'll probably be forthcoming at a future meeting. OK. And that's what Thank that would have been my motion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to agenda item two M six, Assembly Bill one zero two six, business licenses veterans, Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Assembly Bill ten twenty six by Assemblymember Smith would require the Department of Consumer Affairs or DCA and any board within the DCA to grant a fifty percent fee reduction for an initial license to applicants who provide satisfactory evidence that they have served as an active duty member of the United States Armed Forces or the California National Guard and were honorably discharged. Staff are projecting a minor fiscal impact with an estimated fee revenue loss of approximately $2,000 annually. Staff recommend the CBA make a motion to adopt a support position on AB 1026. I will turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Are there members' uh, questions for the presentation? Uh, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, Madam President, I, I had meant to go back to the uh, M5, at, and I do move that we uh, have a watch position because uh, that's what we had with the bill uh, in uh, when it was presented before. So where we are back on agenda item 2M5, Assembly Bill 646, Mr. Jacobson has made a motion for a watch position. Members, do I have a second to that motion? I do not have a second to that motion. I'll second, I'll second the motion. I'm, I don't know who that is. Deirdre Robinson. Okay, I didn't see your hand and I couldn't tell who you were. So, so now- I, I, couldn't, 
I couldn't get it there quick enough. I apologize. That's that's quite all right. It's a fast moving meeting. So we have a <laughs> motion and a second. And I need to know whether there is any further discussion from members. Seeing that there is none before we take a vote, we need to open for any discussion from the public. Moderator, please. This is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? So please do. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Would you call for the vote and please provide the results? Dan Jacobson? Yes. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? No. Can you repeat that, please, Ms. Salazar? No. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? No. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Now on to item, uh, agenda item 2M6, Assembly Bill 1026, Business Licenses Veterans, Mr. Ibarra. Hello once again. Assembly Bill 1026 by Assemblymember Smith would require the Department of Consumer Affairs and any board within the DCA to grant a 50% reduction for an initial license to applicants who provide satisfactory evidence they have served as an active duty member of the United States Armed Forces or the California National Guard and were honorably discharged. Staff is projecting a minor fiscal impact of around $2,000 annually. Staff recommend the CBA make a motion to adopt the support position on AB 1026. I'll turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Members, I'm looking for any questions or discussion regarding Mr. Ibarra's presentation. Uh, Ms. Tu? I was gonna make a motion to support staff recommendation of support. Uh, I, I didn't ask for the motion yet, but I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any other comments or discussion. Ms. Leone, do you have comments? Or are you in the, in the motion mode right now? I'm in the question mode. So my have question, your question please. please, thank you. Are there, are we currently um, providing a reduction in fees for any other community members or is this the first one? that the board is considering in, uh, in Ms. Pierce, um, this is the first um, piece of legislation that we've seen that's proposing this type of um, fee reduction. Um, if something else is proposed, um, we would certainly be bringing it forward to the board. I do know that we have um, a provision in place, um, I think it's for license renewal, that allows for um, waiver of fees for military individuals, um, but that's um, all that's on the books right now. The reason for my comment is um, there are many communities that have been impacted, especially recently with COVID, um, communities with you know people with disabilities, low to moderate income. So as I saw this, I was like, okay, there are other uh, communities that have been impacted or could use potential uh, removal or reduction in fees so that we can remove financial barriers. So as we see other bills or opportunities, I, I'd like just the, the board and the team to, to think about, you know, uh, if we're moving financial barriers, are we missing any critical communities? Thank you. Are there any other questions from the members? Seeing that there are none, Ms. Two, would you make a motion, please? Yes, I would like to make a motion to support uh, uh, the staff recommendation of support position on this bill. Thank you. Members, do I have a second? Ms. Leone? I second it. 
Thank you. Any further discussion from members? Seeing that there is none moderator, would you please open to the public for any of their comments? Thank you. Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and provide the result? Thank you. Dan Jacobson? Yes. So, Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Daryl Page? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Excuse me, uh, Madam President. I did have my hand raised prior to taking the vote. I'm, I think I fear it wasn't seen in time. I had a question before we conclude the vote, if that's appropriate. And if not, I'm willing to wait until afterwards. How should we proceed, please? Please, Ms. Robinson, and I'm sorry if I did miss you. Uh, what, what is your question or comment? That's okay. I, I'm going back to Ms. Um, uh, Leon's suggestion that this bill include other communities that may be as impacted as the military. And I'm wondering at this time, would this be an appropriate time to uh, for the board to perhaps talk with the author about that inclusion of that thought process for this particular bill, therefore um, eliminating the need or necessity to for every community that would be um, a member of this particular group to receive this benefit could be included. Is that a possibility at this time? Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Any other discussion from members? Salazar. Thank you uh, for allowing additional comment. Uh, I would ask that we maybe not um, do that and ask staff to evaluate some of the bills. It, we're right in the beginning of the legislative session and there could be other bills that may be addressing this. Um, my in in the experience with other bills regarding the military often it was a specific reaction to the movement that is forced upon the members of the military not necessarily a financial issue is that they have to continue to move around so frequently um, and that is a, a an issue that is possibly unique to this population and although um, the other groups certainly should be evaluated. I think maybe the, the situations might be slightly different um, to try to bundle them together. Uh, so that's just comment and I appreciate uh, uh, the indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, and yes, it seems that we need to uh, deal with the bill as it stands uh, at this point. So uh, the uh, is the motion and the second still on the table? It, let me just say this, if you will, based on uh, Ms. Salazar's comments, I'm cool with just letting it rest as is, and we'll be looking forward to um, viewing or participating in the review of other bills that may be concerning about our other communities. So if it moves us forward, I will relinquish my previous request. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the motion and the second still uh, valid, and we're somewhere in the middle of the voting process. Ms. Reed, would you please continue? Okay, Deirdre Robinson. Yes. Katrina Salazar. Yes. Michael Savoy. Yes. Mark Silverman. Yes. Yen Tu. Yes. And Nancy Corgan, yes, the motion carries. Thank you. 
Moving on to uh, agenda item 2M7, Assembly Bill 1386, License Fees, Military Partners and Spouses. Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Assembly Bill 1386 by Assemblymember Cunningham would prohibit a board within the Department of Consumer Affairs from charging an initial or original license fee to an applicant who meets the existing expedited licensing requirements for spouses, domestic partners, or other legal partners of members of the armed forces with an assigned duty station in California. AB 1386 has been referred to the Assembly Business and Professions Committee and is currently awaiting a hearing date. Staff are projecting a minor fiscal impact with an estimated fee revenue loss of approximately $1,500 annually. Staff recommends the CBA make a motion to adopt a support position on AB 1386. And I'll turn it back to President Corga for discussion and I'm available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Members, are there any questions regarding this presentation? I see that there are none. Members, do I have a motion? Mr. Jacobson. I move to adopt staff's position. Thank you. Do I have a second? Ms. Owens? Yes, I second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from members? Seeing there are no hands raised, moderator, would you please open for any public comments? Thank you. Yes, this is the moderator, members of the public. If you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. And Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and provide the results? Dan Jacobson? Yes. Sershi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 2M8, Senate Bill 772, Professions and Vocations, Citations, Minor Violations. Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Senate Bill 772 by Senator Ochoa Bo would prohibit any board, bureau, or commission within the Department of Consumer Affairs from assessing an administrative fine for a violation of the applicable licensing act or any adopted regulation if the violation is a minor violation. The bill defines a minor violation as one in which all of the conditions identified on the page are met. The violation did not pose a serious health or safety threat. There is no evidence that the violation was willful. The licensee was not on probation at the time of the violation. The licensee does not have a history of committing the violation and the licensee corrects the violation within 30 days from the date notice of the violation is sent to the licensee. According to the bill though, a violation is minor if there's no evidence that the violation was willful. However, the language does not define what willful would entail. Historically, for administrative matters, the courts do not view willful as intentional. Rather, the typical standard for willful is an act where a violator knew or should have known of the violation and have chosen to ignore the rule of law. Accordingly, by committing the violation, the act is willful. This would appear to run contrary to the author's intention. The bill also does not clearly define what constitutes notice. Is a notice for this purpose the initial letter informing the licensee there is a potential violation, or is the notice the citation itself? which is issued when a violation occurs and is accompanied by the fine assessment. Under existing law, there appears to be no ability to separately issue the citation and the accompanying okay. fine. As noted in the analysis, the CBA's largest number of citations are issued for failing to comply with the minimum yearly continuing education requirement. Since this violation is not one that can be corrected, 
that would not meet condition number five as identified in the bill, if this measure were to pass, there would likely be a minimal fiscal impact to the CBA, which staff are presently working on and will be presented at the May CBA meeting. Staff recommend the CBA make a motion to take a watch position on this bill. Further, staff recommend that a letter be sent to the author identifying concerns regarding the lack of a definition for the terms notice and willful, which could result in issues during implementation should the bill pass. I will turn it back to President Corrigan for discussion and I and also Mr. Franzella, our enforcement chief, are available to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Members, are there any questions regarding this presentation? Seeing that there are none, uh, do I have a motion in this regard? Melina Lopez. Thank you. I make a motion to watch this bill as staff recommends. Thank you. Do I have a second? Ms. Robinson? I second the motion. Thank you. Members, is there any further discussion regarding this topic? And seeing that there um, are no further questions, moderator, would you please open it to the public? Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, click on the bottom right corner, the Q&A icon, and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and provide the results? Dan Jacobson? Yes. Soshi Leon? Soshi Leon? Yes. Luis Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owens? Yes. Ariel Che? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yin Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 2M9. This is Assembly Bill 339, State and Local Government Open Meetings. Mr. Ibarra? Thank you. Our next bill is Assembly Bill 339. Assistant Executive Officer Deanne Pierce is going to present this bill for us. Thank you. AB 339 uh, by Assembly Member Lee, which had an analysis included in the second mail out, would make changes to the three primary open meeting acts in California, which apply to state agencies, local governmental en entities, and the legislature. The, CP, the CBA operates under the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act. In addition to the existing provisions of the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act, this bill would revise the definition of a meeting of a state body under the Open Meeting Act to include a virtual congregation of a majority of members of a state body using teleconference technology, require that all meetings include an opportunity for all persons to attend via a call-in option or an internet-based service option that provides closed captioning services. Both a call-in and an internet-based service option would be provided to the public. Require that at least one member of the state body shall be physically present at the location specified in the notice of the meeting to ensure that members of the public are able to give public comment in person. This location must be publicly accessible and able to accommodate a reasonable amount of people given the circumstances requires that instructions on how to attend the meeting of the state body via call-in or internet-based service will be posted online along with the meeting agenda at least 72 hours before all regular meetings and at least 24 hours before all special meetings. It would require that consistent with the Daimali Alator Bilingual Services Act, the posted meeting instructions shall be translated into all languages of which 5% of the population of the state body's jurisdiction speaks. 
As proposed, there may be some minor impacts to the CBA. However, all are focused on increased transparency and public participation. At this time, the author's office has informed DCA that this bill may undergo amendments, which may remove impacts to state agencies. If the bill is not amended, staff will provide further analysis, including any fiscal impact for the CBA's consideration at the May meeting. With this in mind, staff recommend the CBA monitor AB 339 and not take a formal position. Staff will continue to monitor for amendments that may exclude state entities. That concludes my presentation on this agenda item. I'll now turn it back over to President Corrigan, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Members, do we have any questions regarding this presentation? I see that there are none. Oh, Ms. Melina Lopez, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you, President Corrigan. Um, Ms. Pierce, um, I understand that staff is recommending that we monitor the bill. How is that action different from a watch position? Ms. Pierce? That is an excellent question. Uh, so the watch position, there's not really too much difference in terms of what we would be doing. One is just actually going on the record as taking a position, while the other one is just primarily kind of more of an in-house monitoring. With regards to this particular bill, since there's some indication that uh, the author is going to consider amendments to eliminate us uh, or state agencies from the provisions of the bill, um, I, I think that monitor would be fine, but I think that the board could also, you know, entertain a watch position. So I, I think either would, would work. Thank you. Any further, uh, Ms. Salazar? Thank you. Um, and I understand we, you know, it's completely at the board discretion. I, I would just share my opinion is that um, I think we should be judicious about weighing in and weigh in on the most critical things. So um, I'm not hearing staff say that this is going to move so fast we won't have time to reevaluate at May. Um, and so I would uh, support just monitoring it because I don't want to have have the people at the Capitol just get used to watches, not watches. You know, I don't want to overexpose our opinion. Um, and uh, so that would just be my suggestion uh, and maybe ask for clarification of staff if there is any reason to believe that uh, this will be moving forward prior to our next meeting where we would not be able to take a watch support or a opposed position. Thank you. Ms. Pierce. Uh, we would definitely still have an opp opportunity to, you know, take a position at the May meeting, um, despite what um, happens with the bill. Um, even if the bill were to go forward as proposed, um, I, I don't see the impact to us um, being uh, significant. Um, so, uh, but I have no concerns waiting until the May meeting to either provide an update that we've been, um, state agencies have been amended out, um, or um, uh, that we, you know, take a formal position of uh, support, oppose, um, watch, or other. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from members? And it's sounding like we're comfortable uh, just monitoring this, so not receiving a motion uh, from members. I will ask the moderator then to then turn this over to the public for any comments. Thank you. This is the moderator, members of the public. If you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Please do, thank you. Um, given where we are on our agenda and the timing, et cetera, I am opting to uh, skip agenda item 2N and go to 2P. I believe we have uh, 
our participant available. This is the Department of Consumer Affairs Director's Report on Departmental Activities. We have DCA Board and Bureau Relations Manager, Ryan Perez. Mr. Perez? Yes, good afternoon, Board President Corrigan, Board Members, Executive Officer Bowers, and CBA staff. I'm Ryan Perez with the Board and Bureau Relations Division at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to provide a department update to your board. Uh, Luz Molina Lopez, congratulations on your reappointment and thank you for your willingness to serve. COVID-19 has affected every aspect of our work. DCA offices remain open with preventative measures to safeguard the health and safety of our employees and visitors. DCA and its boards and bureaus are maximizing telework to help reduce COVID transmission risk for all employees. Public health measures such as distancing, face covering, and frequent hand washing are required for those employees who cannot telework. Thank you to EO and board staff who have been working so hard to maintain excellent customer service and protect the public throughout these challenging times. DCA is pleased to announce that on January 12th, Governor Newsom appointed Monica Vargas of Sacramento to the role of Deputy Director of Communications at the department. Uh, Monica has been an information officer in the California Governor's Office of Emergency Service, or Cal OES, since 2015. She was also an information officer at DCA from 2013 to 2015. She joined DCA last month and hit the ground running. On February 2nd, Governor Newsom appointed Sarah Murillo as Deputy Director of Administrative Services at DCA. Ms. Murillo is a gain, has gained a wide range of experience in her nearly 20 years of service to Californians in various state departments, including California Complete Count since 2020. Ms. Marillo comes to DCA with a skill set that makes her well suited to support all of the entities within our department, and her appointment fills the final vacancy in DCA's executive office, and DCA is very pleased that she's uh, joined us. One of our top priorities in board and bureau relations uh, is appointments. And I would like to provide just a brief overview. Currently, the board has one vacancy, which is a licensed member appointed by the governor, uh, which is the position formerly held by um, Carolyn Nicholson. And member Dan Jacobson is serving in his grace period, which will end on January 1st, 2022. Once, of course, he's reappointed. Uh, DCA and all of the appointing authorities share in the goal of a, a fully seated, diverse, and effective board. Filling current and upcoming vacancies is and always will be our priority. That being said, if any members know of any great candidates or if any members of the public attending the meeting are interested in serving, please find the link titled Board Member Resources on DCA's homepage to apply for an appointment. For current board members, 2021 is a mandatory sexual harassment prevention training year. This means all employees and board members are required to complete the training during this year. I'd also like to remind you that Form 700 filings are due by April 1st, 2021. You as board members are designated appointees required to complete a statement of economic interest Form 700, even if you have no reportable interests. If you have any questions about how to file, you may speak to the department's conflict of interest filing officer, Jill Johnson, in DCA's Office of Human Resources. For questions related to what activities or items you would otherwise include in that statement, you can also contact DCA's uh, legal counsel. The Board and Bureau Relations Office recently held a brown bag training session on the topic of stakeholder engagement for board leadership. The purpose of the training was to discuss the most effective ways to include all voices while maintaining appropriate boundaries and keeping the focus on consumer protection. The DCA Executive Office, Legal, Legislative Affairs Division, and Communications Division joined in the discussion of transparency, perceptions, and the legal requirements for interacting with industry associations, advocates, licensees, and the public. The DCA Executive Office also recently hosted a two-hour meeting for board leadership where Director Kimber Kimberly Kirkmeyer and Deputy Director Christine Lawley provided updates on a variety of topics, including licensing compacts, COVID-19 related issues, and reappointment guidance, among uh, a variety of other subjects. The department has received positive feedback related to these sessions, and there will be more to come in the near future. Thank you to the California you, Board of County Leadership for their engaged participation during the two sessions mentioned above. 
Uh, finally, I'd like to let you know about two exciting new initiatives launched by DCA Director Kirk Meyer for 2021 to enhance DCA services to all boards and bureaus. The first is an executive officer cabinet. Uh, this group of board and bureau executives will maintain regular communication, provide feedback and information to DCA, and assist with several, uh, special projects that will impact all boards and bureaus. And thank you to Executive Officer Bowers for your leadership on the cabinet. The second is the Enlightened Licensing Project. This work group is being formed to utilize licensing subject matter experts within the entire Department of Consumer Affairs. The group will help individual boards and bureaus streamline and make their licensing processes more effective and efficient by utilizing best practices, information technology, and other cost-saving measures. These two new initiatives are just now kicking off and we'll keep you updated on their work and impacts. As always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help. And if there's anything that we can do to assist, please do not hesitate to reach out. This concludes my presentation and I will hand it back over to Board President Corrigan. Thank you. Thank you so much for that information and sharing with us, uh, Mr. Prez. Um, and I see one of our members may have a question for you, Mr. Jacobson. Yes, uh, Mr. Perez, thank you for mentioning my name uh, because I may not understand the grace period. Uh, I was appointed on September 1, 2017 by the, by the speaker. So it seems like my full uh, term absent any grace period would end on September 1, 2021. Am I wrong? That is most certainly the case. Our records actually reflect your appointment date as uh, beginning in uh, January. So if it was in fact September, then yes, the grace period would be for one year. I have a certificate on the wall that's, a, that's signed by him. I trust, that. I trust that record. Right here, I'll move the camera over. As well. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be sure to update that in record. Appreciate it. Anything further, members, from uh, from Mr. Perez? Scott, I'd like to say that I know that uh, Vice President Savoy and I both attended the brown bag session on March 19th. And of course, the underscore was consumer protection as a primary goal. And I particularly like a like the term that was mentioned, having a consumer lens which gives a really important perspective when we're doing our jobs uh, on, on any of the boards, uh, attending those and a very meaningful in keeping the public uh, in mind. Uh, these sessions are scheduled to continue, I believe, by the DCA and I found them to be very, found the one so far to be very valuable. Many boards, many of California's boards especially had significant public contact during the pandemic you know, this past year, some reference was made to the Barbering and Cosmetology Board, and I can only imagine what those folks were going through as organizations were, you know, wanting to reopen and trying to determine what to do. So um, anyway, it's the sharing process of those brown bag sessions is just uh, invaluable. And then the, um, the meeting that we had on uh, March 23rd, again, Vice President Savoy and I attended that. It's very nice, very helpful to get updates on what is going on uh, within uh, the DCA. Um, and you mentioned the D and Mr. Prez, you mentioned the DCA Enlightened Licensing Project update. I understand that our chief of licensing, Ms. Center, will take the lead in attending those meetings on behalf of our board and you know, just improving any way that we can uh, for candidates and, and applicants uh, for licensure. So, um, and we look forward to hearing from Ms. Bowers as she is uh, active in, in the cabinet's work as well. Mr. Savoy, having attended, I don't know if you have anything further that you would like to add on this topic. No, I'd just like to say it was very enlightening and it was good to hear from other members of DCA uh not just you know miss kirkmeyer and you'd be happy to hear that i asked the same question that carrie and farrell hines asked about what about in-person meetings in the very near future and uh they'd love them but they got absolutely no direction as to when how and if that could take place so uh, i look forward to that day thank you <coughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Savoy. We certainly all do. So, so thus far, and I'm sure in going forward, the meetings have been very informative, giving an insight and kind of a link, uh, you know, to keep us informed along the way as best as possible. Uh, priorities that are occurring at the department level, and I so appreciate DCA leadership for coordinating the meetings and including all board leadership, all kinds of boards, uh, and those needing guidance and those just needing information. So, uh, Mr. Perez and DCA, thank you so much again. I just really appreciate it all. And uh, so now I will be going um, back to agenda item. And, and that is one through 17, and that is Ms. Pierce, executive, uh, assistant executive officer, and Mr. Ibarra, information and planning officer. Thank you. Thank you, President Corrigan. There are 16 bills under this agenda item. The bills in this category include legislation relating to the Administrative Procedures Act, public meetings of local agencies, the Public Records Act, and general spot bills. These bills may develop into a proposal that is relevant to the CBA, but at this time, there's nothing specific to highlight. I'll turn it back to President Corrigan, and I'm happy to answer any questions the members may have. Members, are there any questions on this uh, agenda item? Seeing that there are none, uh, moderator, would you please open it to, to the public for any comments? Yes, this is the moderator. Members of the public, if you would like to participate, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to our panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Thank you. And moving on to agenda item three, report of the vice president, uh, Mr. Savoy, agenda items of three A, B, and C, and then we'll get on to D. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Agenda, agenda item three A, the appointments and reappointments, the enforcement advisory committee. This item is to recommend the following. The reappointment of Doug Aguilera, the reappointment of Dave Kroll, the reappointment of Chris Pegmeyer, the, re the appointment of Nathan Cowley, and the appointment of Jennifer E. Ziegler to the Enforcement Advisory Committee. The Enforcement Advisory Committee assists the CBA in an advisory capacity with enforcement activities. This includes reviewing closed investigation files providing technical guidance on open investigations, and participating in investigative hearings. I have conferred with the CBA executive officer to verify that the individuals have met the appropriate requirements for license renewal and have demonstrated the skills and knowledge to serve as a member on the Enforcement Advisory Committee. I would like to make a motion, therefore, to reappoint Doug Aguilera, David Kral, Chris Tagmeyer to, from April 1st, 2021 through March 31st, 2023, and appoint Nathan Cowley and Jennifer Ziegler to be effective March 25th, 2021 through March 31st, 2023 to the Enforcement Advisor, Advisory Committee. I'd now like to turn it back to President Corrigan to ask for a second. Thank you, Mr. Savoy. Members, do I have a second to that motion? Mr. Jacobson. I second the motion. Is there, thank you. Is there any further discussion uh, from the members? Seeing that there is none, moderator, would you please open it to the public for any comments? Members of the public, you can participate by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, please yes. do. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and give us the result? Dan Jacobson. Yes. 
Sir Shilion? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee Dee Owen? Yes. Ariel K? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. 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 Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yes. Yin Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corgan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Savoy, please continue. Agenda item 3B. This item is to recommend the following. The reappointment of Angela Hansik and the reappointment of Jose Palma, CPAs to the Qualifications Committee. The Qualifications Committee assists the CBA in its licensure activities by reviewing the expertise and experience of applicants for licensure and making recommendations to the CBA. This includes conducting work paper reviews with the applicant or the employer present to verify that the responses provided are reflective of the requisite experiences for licensure. I have conferred with the CBA executive officer to verify that each individual has met the appropriate requirements for license renewal and have demonstrated the skills and knowledge to serve as a member on the qualifications committee. I would like therefore to make a motion to reappoint Angela Hanzik and Jose Palma to the qualifications committee effective April 1st, 2021 through March 31st, 2023. I'd like to turn it back over to President Corrigan to get a second. Thank you. Members, do I have a second? Uh, Ms. Chu. I will second that motion. Thank you. Members, any further discussion regarding um, the motions and this agenda topic? Seeing that there are none, moderator, would you please open it to the public for comment? This is the moderator. Members of the public, you can click on the Q&A icon, type I would like to make a comment, and send it to all panelists. No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, please do. Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and give us the result? Dan Jacobson? Yes. Soshi Leon? Yes. yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. Dee yes. Dee Owens? Yes. yes. Ariel Che? Yes. Georgia Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yin Tu? Yes. And Nancy Corgan? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Savoy, please continue. Item Agenda 3C, the appointment reappointments to the Peer Review Oversight Committee. This item is to recommend the following. The reappointment of Sharon Selleck and the reappointment of Kevin Harper to the Peer Review Oversight Committee. The Peer Review Oversight Committee assists the CBA in advisory capacity in its oversight of the peer review program. As with all appointments and reappointments, I have verified that the individuals have met the requirements for license renewal and have demonstrated the skills and knowledge to serve as a member on the Peer Review Oversight Committee. I would like to make a motion to reappoint Sharon Selleck and Kevin Harper to the Peer Review Oversight Committee, effective April 1st, 2021 through March 31st, 2023. And I'd like to turn it back over to President Corrigan. A second to that, Ms. Salazar. Thank you, I'd like to second the motion to reappoint Sharon Selleck and Kevin Harper. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Members, any further discussion on this item? Seeing that there are none, moderator, would you please open to the public for any public comment? Members of the public, you can participate by clicking the Q&A icon, typing I would like to make a comment, and sending it to all panelists.
No requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And Ms. Reed, would you call for the vote and provide the result? <laughs> Dan Jacobson? Yes. Soshi Leon? Yes. Luz Molina Lopez? Yes. D.D. Yes. Owens? Yes. Ariel Pay? Yes. Deirdre Robinson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Michael Savoy? Yes. Mark Silverman? Yes. Yen Chu? Yes. And Nancy Corgan? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. And proceeding on, Vice President Savoy, to agenda item 3D. Thank you. I'd like to now give an update on the activities for committee recruitment. As you know or don't know, these have been very hard positions to fill, uh, primarily due to COVID-19 and obviously the restrictions for gatherings, uh, as these committees are most effective when they meet in person. But I'd like to give you an update on the activities that are taking place for us to try to find new members for these committees. Staff have been actively recruiting to fill these various several vacancies on all the advisory committees. However, the CBA has received very little interest. Currently, the EAC, the PROC, and the QC have at least one and sometimes more vacancies within each of these committees. Some of the recruiting efforts include maintaining a permanent page on the CBA's website that focuses on volunteering and serving on a CBA advisory committee and enhancing the visibility of committee information on the homepage, providing committee interest information in the update publication and the monthly report of the executive officer. Cal CPA sharing the information with their membership and direct emails to current and recently retired committee members seeking assistance with committee recruitment. For future recruiting efforts, staff are working on the following. Creating a video regarding serving on an advisory committee. Creating a brochure for distribution at meetings and events. An email campaign. Social media, including information on the insert with CPA renewal applications. Although staff are increasing recruiting efforts, any assistance that CBA members can provide by sharing this information with colleagues on this opportunity would be very much welcome. Staff will be providing updates on committee recruiting activities at future meetings, just to keep the CBA apprised of these efforts. And if you know anybody that would be interested, please reach out to them and tell them to get in touch with either Patty or Deanne because this is an important part of what we do and we rely very heavily on these advisory committees to do our job. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Savoy. And I see some hands raised. I'll start with Ms. Tu. Thank you. And thank you, Vice President, for that uh, update. It's really helpful um, to hear all the plan outreach that uh, staff is planning to do. Um, anecdotally, I was trying to recruit somebody I thought would be very um, uh, helpful to some of this advisory committee. And one first thing she said to me is like, yeah, you're talking to me during tax time. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of timing, I think it will be great if we can recruit during the time when uh, tax season is not so uh, crazy. Uh, but one thing that would be very helpful if um, Patty, our executive director, can send us an email um, a blurb of what that entail in terms of the, um, I know you, you're planning to have flyers and, and um, maybe you can send it to board members so that we can um, um, recruit on our end because uh, 
obviously if you're on the board you're pretty well connected in the community that you live in so i would love to get a simple explanation of what the volunteer effort entails uh, not very long or convoluted but it, uh, it will be very helpful on my end thank you ms robinson Yes, thank you so much, uh, Madam President. I, I'm, I'm asking a comment at this, I'm asking a question at the same time that I'm trying to make a comment. And I guess my question is, and, and this is to say that I feel that the efforts that have been made, the recruitment efforts and future efforts are well organized, but there, is there someone that is specifically targeted as uh, accountable for the recruitment for CBA? You mentioned staff. And the reason that I'm asking about that is usually when there's such difficulty in doing recruitment that there needs to be, you know, one focal point of someone that may be leading that process. And, and that's my question. Is that what is going on um, within the activities for committee recruitment? Thank you, Ms. Bowers, would you respond? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> about that. I pushed the wrong mute button. Um, I would be the primary point of contact on recruitment. I do have a full team of staff that assist with uh, some of the examples Mr. Savoy provided that media posts, website posting, the flyer, but overall I would be that primary point of contact for all recruitment. Okay, okay. then the second part, thank you for that. And to my question is, what type of information are you getting from the recruitment effort. Um, if you are getting, are you running any analytics to see where you're getting the most bang for your buck? Are there upcoming conferences to attend where we could make um, our presence known? I know that we do a, a, a great job with outreach, but I also know that my in my short term with the Board of Accountancy that the development of the outreach uh, strategy was one that I kind of witnessed coming up like the rise of the phoenix out of the sand and out of necessity. So I'm just wondering what if, if there's a focus on that and if board members can assist in that regard and how they might assist. Because um, many of us have talents in recruitment and this may be something that we could uh, offer uh, to assist with the effort. Ms. Bauer? So to answer your first question as far as any analysis on the feedback we're receiving, there really hasn't been a lot, so there's not a lot of data to analyze. The interest uh, has been very minimal. As far as if I understood the second part of your uh, suggestion to expand our outreach effort, I mean, expand our recruitment efforts to some of our outreach events, we have just recently began doing that, but would um, welcome any additional uh, input or support from the members. And so that's something I can give some additional thought to and, and work towards achieving that. And, and if there's any way that I could help with that um, effort, Patty, please uh, utilize my cell phone, please. I'll do anything to help uh, you in that regards as far as recruitment is concerned and maybe some um, simple ways of being able to get some analytics from your recruitment efforts so that you'll know what direction to move forward in. And um, just to say that I'll do anything to help uh, Mr. Savoy. I miss seeing him and sitting next to him in our meetings. So if I can, whatever you use me as you will, that's what I'll say. But Thank I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Ms. Salazar. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, uh, my my suggestion is a long view um, effort uh, for recruitment, but um, I am of the opinion that the people that are giving of their time on these committees are sort of unsung heroes that aren't uh, recognized and they do their work behind the scenes largely. So I would like to ask if uh, we could consider possibly doing a small feature or highlight in our updates to help bring those people on the committees a little bit of recognition 
uh, for the work they do, I think that will serve a dual purpose of also highlighting that work and making other readers of our publications aware of that service opportunity. Um, and in the long run, it might complement our other recruitment efforts. So uh, I appreciate you listening to that suggestion. Thank you. you. Know, and in, in just one comment on that, in light of that, and the fact that we're presently having these web, web meetings, it might not be too bad an idea to highlight in the next few meetings some members to come forward for a period of time from each committee. So I, I think that would be an, an excellent idea. Thank you. Very good idea. Thank you. And Mr. Pei, I do see your hand up as well. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Just a comment I had on um, a little bit of the marketing. I see that we're doing a lot of the traditional boilerplate uh, types of marketing and possibly just to think and just throwing it on the table there. Maybe we need to go a little bit granular. You know, the way the the new way is on your phones. It's quick. It's quick swipes left and right. And maybe we need to start looking at other avenues, maybe like an app for some type of submission through information to get their name in a portal to where at least we can kind of see for their consideration. So my comment would be more of like going a little bit granular in the in the technology part of this to kind of start grabbing information of just interest and then possibly going further down the line for um, the, the longer range. Thank you, Mr. Pei. Anything further members, Ms. Chu? Yes, I was wondering in terms of outreach, do we reach out to uh, any of the CPA firms? Obviously, the associates, uh, some of these, it's great experience and it's great for their resume. Um, do we outreach to those firms? Yes, actually we do. We have uh, committee members and uh, past board members that we've worked with to reach out to their colleagues within the big firms. And so that is that is one of the areas that we recruit from. Thank you. Anything further on this uh, agenda item? Very good discussion. Thank you all. And at this point, we need to break for lunch. We have a time certain. We have our petitioner hearings at 1.30. So time certain means we need to be ready to go. We have lots of other folks involved in that. So you may stay logged in, but please mute your microphones, stop your videos, and be back ready to go at 1.30. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, this is legal. If um, Because we're on this topic, could we just quickly ask for public comment before we go to break? Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for reminding me to do that. Moderator, would you please ask for any public comment? This is the moderator, members of the public. If you would like to participate, click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom right corner of your WebEx screen and type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. I have a request from Jason Fox. Jason, I will unmute you in just a moment. You have been unmuted. This is Jason Fox with Cal CPA, and I, I know I'm standing between lunch and um, everyone at lunch. And so I just want to, because this was a robust conversation, we're committed to assisting the board uh, and, and Ms. Bowers and her team in getting the word out to our membership um, and through our communication channels. And we've done that. I think there's some ideas that we can increase that in those efforts. So just want to add that. Thank you. No further requests have been submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Thank you, members. We will then uh, reconvene for petition hearings at 1.30. Thank you.